I'm Stumpy Nubs, this is Mustache Mike, and welcome to another edition of Behind the Sawdust, the show that takes you deep into the world of glitz and glamour that is woodworking. This week, we tell you what I think of trees, I complain about the weather, we expose Saw Stop for what it really is, Charles Neal will stop by, and we'll give away another tool. But first, the woodworking news. The 2015 Delhi Wood Fair is being held February 4th through 6th at the India Expo Center in Quickie Mart in Greater Noida, India. That's right, India, not Indiana. Visitors will examine the most modern woodworking technology from around the world, including over 500 machines and production lines in the 60,000 square foot venue. Over 450 exhibitors from 20 countries will be there, and all of them are expected to become violently ill from the food. If you're looking for something more local, but still want a little bit of international flair, you might consider the Tupelo, Mississippi Furniture Market on February the 5th through the 8th. Furniture makers from around the world will gather in a 1.6 million square foot space to show off their wares and try to attack the attention of some 30,000 retail furniture buyers who will be attending the event. As everyone knows, Tupelo is the upholstery capital of the world, so attenders should be in for the time of their lives. The Woodworkers Guild of America has a new video about the benefits of HVLP spray systems, covering the basics for anyone who may be mystified by the subject. Personally, I found it lacked the excitement of our 2012 video, where we reviewed three types of HVLP sprayers and caused a firestorm of angry comments when we tested one of them on a kid in a wheelchair. To this day, I still have to explain to people that it was only denatured alcohol and Chip was of legal drinking age. You'll find links to our video and the Woodworkers Guild video in the show notes. Speaking of finishing, Charles Neal has recently introduced an exclusive forum for his online finishing school. Subscribers already have access to over 24 hours of video. It's organized by subject from sanding to staining and a whole lot more. And now they have also a way to discuss their finishing problems with the teacher himself. Charles has over a half century of finishing experience, and he's widely considered to be the most knowledgeable expert on the subject. I highly recommend subscribing to his course, even if it's just for a month. Your finished projects will never be the same. Chris Schwartz has a security blanket. You may think a man who can pull off that beard would have all the security he needs, but without a moving blanket, he feels lost in the shop. He says it amazes him to see students who have never considered using moving blankets to protect their work, whether it's to pad the bench top or to wrap up a completed project before you set it aside. He swears that swaddling his work saves him as much as a day's time repairing bumps and dings that the work pieces might otherwise have to endure. He even makes a game out of it, which you can read about in his blog. The last two editions of 360 Woodworking's 362nd audio podcast touched on safety. Bob, Chuck, and Glenn began with a discussion on jointer push blocks. Do you use jointer push blocks? Oh, absolutely, all the time. You know, if you ever had your hand on top of a workpiece as it's going across those cutters, man, those scare me. You can feel the power. Uh, I don't know if it's going to explode on me. Um, in the podcast there, Glenn said that he knew someone who had some inch-thick walnut blow up on him, and he actually put his hand in the cutter. I'm more worried about feeding a small work piece through and it maybe catches on a little knot and it rips it out of your hand. That's happened to me and that hurt. So I always, always use push blocks. Yeah, and I think that's the point they were trying to get at. Anytime you're in a shop in a work situation, you're going to have to have some personal responsibility. If you're not focused, you know, you are increasing the likelihood that you could get hurt. And almost every time Chuck mentioned that he had seen someone get hurt, the individual afterwards will admit they were, they were pushing the line. You know, it was iffy to practice. Yeah, but of course, on the other hand, you have people who seem to appoint themselves the safety police, and they talked about that in the podcast. Uh, Chuck said that he wrote an article once for um, Popular Woodworking where he had gloves on using the jointer, and he got all kinds of comments calling him an idiot and a moron. And, you know, he, he said that if that's all you have to add to a conversation, just some, you know, little thing about a little safety practice that's not something serious, don't bother because it's just not helpful. Yeah, and obviously he was not saying that safety tips aren't helpful. No, no, he was talking about the people who nitpick or who think they know more than they actually do. You can use the gloves as an example. I did a video a couple years ago where I had gloves on as I was using a table saw, and people just went nuts over that. But 
if you really think about it, it would be awfully hard for tight-fitting gloves to even make contact with the blade, much less get stuck on the blade and suck your arms off. Uh, there's even a video online where somebody is dangling the glove in the blade trying to get it to catch and it just won't no matter how hard he tries. So, you know, the point is that there's a difference between constructive criticism and just talking about things that you really don't know about just because you want to criticize people. Graham Hayden wrote a great blog over at Fine Woodworking about tuning up a coffin smoother. He noted that these tools may look primitive, but they're the result of centuries of evolution at the hands of men who counted on wood body planes to make a living. He tells you how to recognize a good one, how to restore the iron, how to flatten the sole, and how to discover the reason these little blocks of wood remain popular in today's hand tool workshops. Personally, I love coffin smoothers, so much in fact that I'm currently building a really big one that I plan to bury Mustache Mike in. Grab's blog is part of a two article series and is definitely worth checking out. Popular Woodworking Books has a new editor. Scott Francis was formerly with How and Print Books, but begins the new year with a new job. He's already working with several authors on a collection of titles due out this year, including A.J. Hamler's Build It With Dad, Alan Lancer's Wood Turning Projects and Techniques, Michael Crow's Making Mid-Century Modern Furniture, and of course, our own Stumpy Nubs upcoming masterpiece, Homemade Tools from Stumpy Nubs Workshop. Popular Woodworking is also launching a new online woodworking university. Students can select classes they wish to attend from the comfort of their own home, learning through written articles, downloadable resources, and streaming video. Each class will be conducted by an expert in the field who will write his own curriculum. The classes will be held over two or three day periods, and the students who enroll will be provided with a private chat room where they can interact with the instructor and each other. There are only a few classes online right now, but more will be added, including one taught by yours truly this spring. The subject of that class has not been revealed, but I do plan to invite Mike in as a guest speaker to discuss the dust collection benefits of his fine mustache. Mark the Wood Whisperer is asking people about how much they are willing to spend for a good woodworking book. The online conversation, it's generated a wide range of opinions. It includes a poll with selections ranging from, I can get all the content I want online, to prices no obstacle to my learning. It's an interesting conversation, so we decided to continue it here on Point Counterpoint. I have a lot of books. Every wall in my office is covered with shelves full of books. Not only am I willing to spend money on them, I prefer the feel of paper in my hands. I prefer digital books. They're generally less expensive, and I really don't miss the paper cuts I get from the old-fashioned versions. If books are old-fashioned, then we are in big trouble as a society. Woodworking is about tradition, and nothing says tradition like an old leather-bound copy of Moxon or Roubaix. You can't get the same learning experience from a picture of a book on an LCD screen. What Stumpy fails to understand is that reading a woodworking book isn't about the experience. It's about the content. And those of us with poor eyesight can benefit from the zoom feature found only in digital books. And what the lip room fails to understand is that some of us wear glasses just because we look good in them. Not everyone has inch thick pop bottles on our face and even those who do can usually read a piece of paper. Bound books have been teaching woodworkers since Gutenberg printed his lesser known Bible of woodworking joinery and dissertation on chisels in 1468. Perhaps four eyes here doesn't need his glasses for reading, but it's pretty clear to me what the real problem is. He he hates trees. He became a woodworker just to indulge his sick tree slaughtering fantasies, which are now being exposed by his insistence that entire forest be cleared so he can enjoy the feel of paper between his fingers while he reads. The only thing that is clear is that Mustache Mike is one of those new age tree hugging hippies who would rather see an entire generation of children grow up stupid than sacrifice one tree to make a book. Why do you hate children so much? Look. We're getting off topic. The real question is how much are we willing to spend on a woodworking book? My answer is zero, especially if it's one of Stumpy's books. And my answer is a billion dollars because my book is going to be 250 pages of pure woodworking knowledge. Sort of thing somebody around here could benefit from if he actually knows how to read.
Stumpy may be willing to spend a billion dollars on it, but within a week, everyone else will be picking it out of the bargain bin for a nickel. Thousands of copies will find their way into bathrooms where the pages will have real value. They'll be used for wiping, not reading. I wish I could fire you. I wish I could set fire to you. This has been another edition of Point and Counterpoint. If you'd like to weigh in on this subject, please do so in the comments below or at the Wood Whisperer site found in the show notes. Paul Sellers has weighed in on one of the most controversial subjects of all, how a woodworker should sharpen his pencil. The point is, it doesn't matter how you get it sharp, you just want it to be sharp. He points to a hand-cranked sharpener that has served him well, and shares a quote from an old boss who always said, the problem with the dull pencil is there's no point to them. <laughs> I think it's a valid point, but to be blunt, I prefer an electric sharpener. What's the point of turning a crank? Seems awfully dull to me. Jessam has recently introduced an interesting new innovation. They're called clear-cut stock guides, and they're designed to securely guide your workpiece through the table saw. While a featherboard does a good job of holding the board down, these rollers are spring-loaded to easily adjust for thickness. They're designed to prevent kickback, and a slight 5-degree roller angle helps you keep your stock against the fence. They are a little pricey at $250, but they do look like they're a pretty good idea. Thermally modified wood is making its way into the mainstream. Some stores like Woodcraft are selling turning blanks that have gone through a roasting process that exposes them to much higher temperatures than typical drying kilns. The process darkens the wood's color, making maple appear more like cherry. But the most interesting result occurs at the cellular level, creating a harder, more stable, and more insect-resistant wood. It's an interesting technology, but it does significantly increase the cost of pen blanks. And let's face it, if the ink pen in your pocket is becoming infested with insects, you have bigger problems on your hands. In late breaking news, woodworking shops from Maine to the Carolinas went silent this week as millions of people stocked up on hot cocoa and marshmallows, preparing for what is being called snow apocalypse. Most of us didn't get the snow, but we're still going to hear what Stumpy thinks. Well, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool millions of idiots every day, and you must be the National Weather Service. As a woodworker, weather reports are important to me. I need to know if it's going to be rainy before I hike into the woods with an axe over my shoulder to chop a tree into a sideboard. If it's going to be humid in my workshop, it may affect the way I fit my drawers. And if it's going to snow, I have to have enough cold ones on hand to survive until the plows come. So when the National Weather Service tells us to prepare for up to four feet of snow, I don't know, I'm just expecting them to be accurate within at least four feet. But that's not what happened this week. Much of the population that they worked up into a frenzy with phrases like storm of the century and snowmageddon and snowpocalypse, well, they got little more than a light dusting. They shut New York City down, and they didn't even get a foot there. When I was a kid, a foot didn't even shut school down. Perhaps the problem is we forget that weather predictions are just that, predictions, not actual science-based reality. They have no idea if it's going to rain tomorrow. Sometimes they have no idea if it's raining right now. They could increase their accuracy simply by sticking their head out the window, but they can't do that because they have to be on television every three minutes for the next prediction. This is yet another example of how the old way of doing things were better. Old-timey forecasters would have been less dramatic and more accurate. It would go something like this. It was hot today, I know, because everybody looked pretty sweaty. Tomorrow should be fair, with a chance of tolerable by afternoon. Old man Rabishaw's knee is predicting rain overnight, but we'll all be asleep by sundown, so nobody cares. You see, it's realistic. It doesn't promise too much, because it's intentionally vague. That's why I plan on getting all of my weather reports from now on out of the old farmer's almanac. The forecast is always the same. Cold this winter, hot this summer. Gonna get some snow, gonna get some rain. That's a forecast we can all depend on. That's all I've got to say about that. Woodworker's Journal has launched a new website. It follows the recent revamp of its parent company's site, Rockler.com. It's described as a new state-of-the-art online experience designed to work well on both home computers and on mobile devices. Editor Dan Carey says it's just the thing for killing time in line at the DMV. I would add that a good, sturdy mobile device is just the thing for killing other things at the DMV. If you visit the new site, you can enter to win a Bailey table saw. 
Speaking of table saws, when I was looking for a new one for the Stumpy Nubs workshop about a year or so ago, I did look at the Bailey saws. I almost pulled the trigger on one, but I decided to go with the saw stop. Did I make a mistake? Well, that's the subject of this edition of Tool Time. Normally, the stash tries out the tool and gives us his opinion based on his scientifically proven mustache meter But this is my saw, and I've spent over a year getting to know it. So I'm going to review it based on my own criteria. Safety, dust collection, quality, and value. The first question in our review um, is safety. The saw has some definite uh, things they've promoted. So how do you feel about safety? Is it as safe as they say? I think it's actually maybe safer than they say. And the reason I say that is because everybody talks about how it won't cut you. And I mean, obviously that's the big thing, but there's a lot more that you find in the saw that you don't see in other saws. For example, there's four ways to shut the thing off. I mean, there's a paddle switch you can hit with your knee if you get in trouble. There's another switch that you can turn off and lock off for when you're changing the blade. There's a key on the side that you can turn the saw off, take the key with you, and then nobody can use it when you're not there. And there's a big kill switch at the base that you can cut power to the whole thing in case you have to do some kind of maintenance. So as I look across at the uh, saw setting over there, what's the deal with that saw blade guard? That's one of the best safety features that nobody talks about. You know, on my old table saw, I took off the blade guard because I had to make a cut, and I set it aside. I never put it back on because it's just a pain to do it. But with the saw stop blade guard, they made a quick release lever inside. So you can just flip a, a lever, pull the blade guard off, set it aside, do your work, and then put it back in just as quick, flip a lever, and you're ready to go. There's really no excuse to leave it off. And there's even a, a separate riving knife they give you. You can pop in when you've got the blade guard off so you still don't get kicked back. The blade guard itself has a splitter built in. It's got anti-kickback calls, and um, mine even has upper dust collection. Well, you couldn't hardly have a conversation about a saw stop if you didn't consider that hot dog technology. Uh, is that all it's cut up to be? Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, there's good and bad. I could see both sides. Um, if you trigger it, it blows the cartridge, and that costs like 60 bucks. They say to replace the blade, and a good blade can be more than $100, so it can be expensive. But the good part is you still have all your body parts attached. And to tell you the truth, that could be more expensive. One thing that I was concerned about when I was shopping for the saw is I had seen on the internet people saying that it can have false triggers. Um, they can just go off on its own and cost you a lot of money. To tell you the truth, I don't know how often that happens. You know, everybody seemed to know someone who knew someone, one of those things. I've never had a false trigger in the year and a half I've been using it. I think it's maybe kind of a myth or extremely rare. I have set it off um, by mistake a couple of times. I touched it with my aluminum miter fence. I should have had a sacrificial fence on there. And one time I was brushing something away from the saw and I touched the side of the blade just an instant before it had come to a complete stop and that triggered it. Uh, but those were my fault. It wasn't the saw's fault. Another question I've seen on some of the uh, woodworking sites and on the blogs is this question about cutting wet wood. So if you cut wet wood, is it going to bang, you know, stop it? It can, but it would have to be really wet. I mean, like spraying up in your face wet. And who cuts wood like that? Uh, maybe turners. But to tell you the truth, if, if you wonder if it's going to be set off by something, they built in a feature that allows you to disable the trigger, and then you can make your cut, and it will actually tell you if it would have triggered without actually doing it. So you can test wood that you think might be too wet or if you think there's a big nail inside or something like that. I don't know if you'd be cutting one with a big nail inside, but the point is you don't have to trigger it. If there's any doubt, you can test it out. Okay. So overall then, one to five on safety, how do you rate it? I don't see any reason to give it less than five full stars because I don't see a safer saw out there. What, no mustache on the mustache meter? That's your jam. So tell us about dust collection. Every shop, uh, modern shop, is concerned about dust collection. How does this saw perform? Well, SawStop says that it gets near 100% dust collection. Um, and when you look at the way they designed the saw, they certainly did everything possible to collect every bit of dust that they could. There's a shroud on the inside that covers the blade and gets most of the dust right there. Um, mine has upper dust collection, which is really a great idea. It's got a small tube, and you think, how can you get enough airflow through that? 
but it's actually the way they designed that blade cover. It takes advantage of the turbulence created by the blade, which pushes the dust out and into your system, so you don't need all the suction at the top. It's really a great idea. The problem is that it all comes down to your dust collector. If you don't have a good dust collector, and you haven't properly run your ducts, especially if there's bends between, too many bends between the saw and the collector, you're not gonna get that great of dust collection with any saw. Uh, here in this shop, we've moved stuff around so much that our ducts are kind of a mess sometimes. And so I haven't really experienced 100% dust collection. But I still think it's better than any other saw that I've used. And other than, I would have liked to see a six inch board on the back. I know that a lot of people use four inch dust collection, but my saw is the industrial saw. And you would think an industrial saw would have bigger dust collection anyway. And besides, it's easy to adapt down from a six inch to a four inch. I don't know how that would change the inside of the saw, but I would have liked to have seen that. Otherwise, uh, it does really well in dust collection. So when matched with a proper dust collector, how would you rate this saw as far as dust collection? Um, I would say definitely four out of five stars. Obviously then we want to know quality wise. How, how do you rate this as far as quality? Well, that was another thing I was wondering about as I was shopping for a saw. Um, because, you know, this saw in particular, you've got the issue of the brake. When that triggers, that's got to send a lot of energy right through the saw. And I would think that that would throw everything out of adjustment. I did expect it to come tuned up and perfectly adjusted, and it did. They really spent the time at the factory. But after I had set it off one or two or three times, I was surprised that it was still in perfect alignment. And the reason is because the thing is just massive. I mean, if you look inside the saw, everything is overbuilt. It's just big and beefy. The, uh, the arbor's bigger, the trunnion, the, the bearings, everything is just overbuilt and I mean it weighs the industrial saw weighs 700 pounds all that weight it not only keeps it aligned and but it also dampens vibrations gives you a better cut we even dropped the saw twice when you're trying to put it on the mobile base and it still you know performs just like new all right how about adjustments on this saw well have you seen how big those wheels are I mean it's like steering wheels uh, you would think that with a wheel that big, I mean, you'd have to. It's a five horsepower motor and all that cast iron inside. You, it'd be hard to turn. You need big wheels. It's actually not the case. I was really impressed that you could just use one finger to make the adjustments because they really took the time to balance the carriage. Uh, it's perfectly balanced. And they also have a uh, gas lift feature on the lift mechanism that makes raising and lowering the blade easy. So you can really make fine adjustments and they stay where you adjust them to. All right. Now you're never gonna get good accurate cuts without a good fence. How about the fence on the saw stop? Like everything else, it's huge. I mean, it weighs twice as much as my uh, old table saw fence. And it still adjusts smoothly. The cam works nice and locks down and stays put. I tried to uh, make it deflect, really pushed on it hard. I can't get it to deflect. It's just that well built. I did, um, after about a year, I put my Incra LS back on the saw. And the reason was because I had so much invested in that. But to tell you the truth, I miss the simple accuracy of the saw stop fence. So I'm planning on actually putting it back on. So given all those different factors, how would you rate the quality to them? Definitely five out of five. I really don't think it lacks anywhere. All right. Now, uh, the big one, the price, value. How does saw stop stack up as far as value? That is a big one because it's expensive. All that you know, precision and uh, you know, craftsmanship comes at a price. Um, I got the industrial model with a five horse motor and I got all the accessories and extra blades, cartridges, uh, shipping, freight, it all came out to about $5,000. That's a lot of money for a saw. My truck didn't even cost that much. You can get them less expensive. They do make a one and three quarter horsepower cabinet saw that you can get with just a basic fence and no accessories for about $2,300, but still a lot of money. But while I was price shopping, I found that the saw stop was priced about the same as equal models of Powermatic, which is a good saw, but it doesn't have the features, the safety features the saw stop has. And the Unisaw is actually more expensive than the comparable saw stop. So they are competitively priced. The problem is that those prices, it does, you know, get a lot of woodworkers out of the market for them. So, you know, I can see people's complaints and, 
you know, it's not their fault. They built a great saw and they priced it competitively in the market, but still it's expensive. And so for that, I give it four out of five stars. So there you have it. The saw stop cabinet saw gets an average of 4.5 out of five stars, nearly a perfect score. Stumpy has produced a more in-depth and entertaining review video. Check it out over at StumpyNubs.com. We have a special guest for our tip this week. It comes from master woodworker Charles Neal. We're going to hang them on a French cleat. And I feel sure almost everybody out there knows what a French cleat is. But in case you don't, I'm going to show you. Up here or wherever we choose, we've got the French cleat. French cleat, you can do it on 30 degree or you can do it on 45. One piece goes on the wall. And then this is attached to the cabinet and as it comes down, one interlocks into the other. And that's what holds it on the wall. I hate looking at a set of cabinets and seeing screws all over the place. And inevitably, somebody's going to miss hitting a stud or, or a stud's not, if you got a small cabinet, there's no stud back there, it gets crazy. This French cleat will be attached to the back up here. We'll be able to glue it, screw it, really secure it well. What we're going to do is we got to notch it down here. We got to take some of this out so that you have room when you go to hang it to slip it up over so it interlocks. Now we'll do that all the way down. Except, of course, except for the end panel here where it's, it shows. Make sure when you're locating your cleats that you locate them in exactly the same spot. Then you can go in and you can take a long strip that goes on the wall and you can go down that wall and screw wherever you want, wherever you need. And if you miss and don't hit a stud and you got a little ugly spot, who cares? It's hidden. And then when you go to install them, it's just set them. They're there. Charles teaches fine woodworking over at cnwoodworking.com. Now for the moment you've all been waiting for, this week's Tormac giveaway winner. Pat Zimmerman has won a Tormac Bench Grinder Tool Rest courtesy of Affinity Tools. We still have two more prizes to give away, including a new T4 sharpening system. Here's how to enter. Number one, if you haven't already, and I don't know why you wouldn't have, you need to be a subscriber to our YouTube channel. Number two, if you're not already, you need to add the Stumpy Nubs Twitter feed to your follow list. And then number three, you have to add the Affinity Tools Twitter feed to your follow list on Twitter. And then you need to tweet out this. Well, that about wraps things up for this edition of Behind the Sawdust. Tune in next week to see me pick ticks out of Mike's stash like a monkey. Don't forget to tell your friends about us on social media and visit StumpyNubs.com at least once a week for the best in woodworking infotainment. It's a great place to sit back and have yourself a cold one, because you've earned it, my friend. <laughs>